really nice to see to see everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Yael Friedman, and I am the former director of international programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City, and a current educational consultant with the Auschwitz Jewish Center. So first, I want to thank Adara and Sarah for inviting us back uh, to run another workshop for you this year. This follows up on a workshop last year um, that many of you did with my colleague Maciek Zabirowski, um, who's here with us again this year. Um, he is the head of learning at the Auschwitz Jewish Center. And the workshop last year was about the Jewish history of the town of Oświęcim, uh, which is the Polish name for Auschwitz. Uh, but no worries, if you weren't there at the workshop last year, you don't need to have been there to participate and appreciate today's session. Uh, so I want to start a little bit about, tell you a little bit about the Auschwitz Jewish Center. Um, I might refer to it as the AJC. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, it's a satellite location of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Poland, and it's the only Jewish presence remaining in the vicinity of Auschwitz. Uh, it's located about two miles from the former camps. And you can see here in this Google Maps image uh, that it's not actually very far at all. Um, the Auschwitz Jewish Center commemorates Oświęcim's Jewish community, preserves Jewish memory in the town, and educates about the contemporary dangers of anti-Semitism and other forms of prejudice. Now, Jews lived in Oświęcim for centuries, and they built a rich and diverse community. In this photo, you see um, a postcard of the Great Synagogue um, from the early 20th century. Uh, before the Holocaust, Jews made, about, made up about 60% of the total population, and they were well integrated into the town. The area was annexed by, into the Third Reich and occupied within days of the Nazi invasion of Poland. Uh, and sadly, about 90% of Oświęcim's Jews were killed during the Holocaust. There were some Jews who returned to the town after the war, um, but most left by the 1960s. And the last surviving, the last Jewish resident of Oshvangim passed away in 2000. So since 2000, uh, the Auschwitz Jewish Center has served as the guardian of Jewish memory in the town. And here you see the three buildings um, that make up the Auschwitz Jewish Center. So the AJC is housed in the only surviving synagogue, the Chavra Lamdei Mishnayot Synagogue, um, as thank you, Matek, <laughs> for pointing it out. Um, as well as two adjoining buildings uh, that were Jewish homes before the, the Holocaust. Um, and they now house our Jewish museum and Cafe Bergson. So in, yes, thank you. In this photo, you see the exterior of the Chaver Lamdei Mishnayot Synagogue from the 1930s. And in this next photo, you see the interior of the, of the synagogue uh, which was rebuilt in the 1990s based on survivor recollections of the synagogue. Um, so this is what it looked like before the Holocaust. Now, today, we're going to explore one of our digital tools to learn more about the Jewish history of the town. So the AJC created an app a few years ago, ago called um, Oshpitzin, which is the Yiddish name that the Jews called the town. Um, and that is the image you see on the left of the screen. Um, and more recently, we partnered with the uh, USC Shoah Foundation to create an I Walk walking tour. Uh, so that's the image you see on the right of your screen. Uh, both apps highlight different sites related to the Jewish history of the town, and they're, they're both enhanced by artifact images, photos, and descriptions. Um, and the I Walk app also includes clips of survivor testimony uh, from the USC Shoah Foundation. So today, Maciek is going to facilitate a workshop using uh, the content of the iWalk app. Um, don't worry, we're going to be using a different media, so you don't need to download the app. Um, but he's going to model it in a way uh, that you can hopefully replicate with your own students. So a brief agenda for today's um, workshop is I'm going to hand it over to Maciek shortly. Um, he's going to introduce the workshop. Uh, we'll break up into breakout groups 
uh, for a little group work, and then we'll come back together and each group is going to do a short presentation. And then we're going to have plenty of time for questions or a general discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Machek. Uh, thank you so much, Yael. And uh, thank you again, Sarah, and the entire team of the center for, uh, for having us and having me over um, again. It's, uh, it's a real privilege. Uh, right. So uh, before we start, before we get down to the nitty and gritty of the educational work, I wanted to we wanted to create a space for for asking questions, and uh, we imagine we might you might have questions along the way. So for that, in order to collect them and uh, have space to to address them, we're going to share uh, a slider code for you to record your questions live. So you, in order to you 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 may you may notice, but just in case, just to be on the same page. You know, just for everyone to be on the same page. In order to use the tool, you need to either open another tab in your browser, so just another tab, uh, you know, in Safari or whatever you're using, or or Mozilla or, or Google Chrome, and then please visit the address you can see here, so slido.com, and then you'll be prompted to enter a code uh, after a hashtag. So that's three seven two one two eight, and uh, my great colleague Yael will share that uh, will share that uh, code also. Uh, in in the chat or if you're if you have a cell phone around you you can simply scan that qr code and this will open up the website for asking questions um, directly on your on your cell phone so this will open whichever way you choose um, in your browser either on on your computer or ipad or or a phone you will get you'll get a window where you will be able to record to record your your questions and um, uh, at, at the end of the session well We'll be happy to address them. Also, uh, I'll, I will explain this briefly in a second. In each of the worksheets that we'll be using, there will be a space for questions as well, content related. But if you have ever any, any other general questions or not comments regarding uh, our time spent here, the presentation, the subject matter, you're absolutely welcome to, to use this. So I just want to make sure that everybody has had a chance to visit. So maybe I'm, I'm going to give us maybe 15 more seconds just to be sure that everybody has uh, been able to access Slido and that window. If there's any issues, if it does not work, please let us know either by voice or on the chat, which, whichever way is, um, is more comfortable. Otherwise, if you could give us a thumb up, just so, so that we know that um, you have Slido, Slido at hand, um, unless you don't want to use it, that's also fine. But I'm just, thank you, Sarah. I'm just, uh, just double checking with those of you who are interested that you've had that you've had this um, this chance. Okay, so maybe 10, uh, 10 more seconds. Um, right, okay. Um, all right. So yeah, so now that we have uh, we have this sorted, I'll um, I'll stop sharing for just a second because I wanted to share with you um, a link. Uh, I will ask you to, to visit the chat in a moment. In, in the chat, I'm going to share a link to an important document, which will give you access to your respective, uh, uh, respective worksheets. So the, the way we're going to do this is we're, going to, is we're going to use a tool called Padlet. We're going to divide up into, into eight groups, okay? Because we have eight, and because we have eight uh, eight worksheets prepared for you. Each has a different theme, and I'll, I'll show this in a second. But before we get there, I'm, I'm going to share uh, a link now in the chat. This is a link to a very, uh, to a very simple, very basic Google Doc. So I just want to be sure that you all have again have access to it. I'll go back to I'll go back share I'll, I'll go back to sharing, and I'll show you what what this is uh, what this is all about. So the, um, yeah, here we are. Exactly. You're, I can see that you're joining now. So we have this very simple, uh, very simple Google Doc, which has links to rooms, to eight rooms. They're equivalent with eight worksheets. Let me show you what a worksheet would look like. I'm going to share uh, share with you a random, a random worksheet from uh, from the workshop. I just need to remove one little window here. Dang. Okay. So the work the the worksheets look like this, right? There we have worksheets with uh, with different with different content. All of the worksheets are related obviously to the Jewish history of, of Oshvintim. And we're going to use the content, which is also available in the, uh, in the iWalk app that uh, Yael has already mentioned. So these are, uh, these are worksheets connected with concrete locations in, in Oshvintim, such as, for example, the site of the Great Synagogue. This is the title here, which 
has been already mentioned by Yara. We also have another example would be we have um, a worksheet and content about the main market square. And each time you get access to your worksheet, what you have is uh, a general description of, of the place as it appears also on the app, right? So that's transferred from the app to a Padlet. You have historical, historical photographs. In this case, these are two historical photographs. You also have a modern view. Uh, and obviously, once uh, once you get into uh, into a Padlet, you can you can click on each of the images to see them full screen. Then you will also uh, you will also have um, a video testimony. These are brief, like three to four minute clips, which uh, feature a selection of testimonies from the USC Shah Foundation archive, video archives, and these are former residents of Oshinchim Holocaust survivors. So. The very few people who did survive the Holocaust, they were born in the Shinchim, they, they survived uh, the Shoah, and then they gave testimony to USC Shoah Foundation. So you're, you're welcome to watch this. And then for the, for the watching, for the reflection, we have questions for you. Actually, we'll, we would like to ask each of the groups once you, once you um, join your respective groups to discuss, read and discuss questions before watching a clip. That's number one here in the right column, then also to respond to questions after the clip also using comments in the comment section. And then if you happen to have any additional questions, I mean, follow-up questions that you you've, that have been sparked by, by watching and discussing, then we would also like ask, ask we would like to ask you to, um, uh, to, um, to respond. And I can see a question to, yeah, a, a request to ask, to, to share the link again, absolutely. I'm sharing the, the link to those Padlets again to all of you, okay? Because I'm, I'm aware that you don't have access to chat history once you get, well, literally kicked out of uh, kicked out of Zoom and then you return. So here it is again. I hope I hope you you have it now. All right. So um, so yeah. So these are the these are the Padlet. So again, uh, what's going to uh, what's going to happen is in a moment we'll we'll uh, um, we're going to we're going to send you to to breakout rooms. We're going to uh, literally. We're going to give you 15 minutes for starters. Okay. We hope this is sufficient for uh, for um, exploration and uh, and discussion. If not, we're also obviously happy to to extend this. But we'll start with we'll start with uh, 15 uh, 15 minutes. Let me just very quickly jump into the breakout rooms and make sure that the, that the settings are correct. Yes, it's uh it's 15 minutes and uh this is automatic so you will not have to uh, you will not have to push any buttons in order to in order to join to join the rooms will be also in the background we'll, we'll be still at the meeting me uh me and yal as well so if you need to um if you need to um you know contact us just just hit a button in the in your just call a moderator from your from your menu and then you'll well, will be uh, will be with you. Just double checking that everything is okay. Is right? Are we are we ready? Like, I know our Wi-Fi sometimes ebbs and flows. Okay, I can hear someone. If you could please, unless you have a, a topic related question, if, you, if I could kindly ask you to mute yourself for the for this part. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. So now we'll we'll hit the we'll hit the rooms literally. We'll go to your rooms. So once you're in the room, please make sure uh, before we get there, please be sure to have the to have the Zoom document, the Zoom. The, I'm sorry, the Google Doc document on you, so that uh, so that you can once you're in the room, you can select the corresponding uh, room number from that uh, from the document and get the access to your uh, to the appropriate uh, to the appropriate uh, worksheet. Uh, if there's a problem, you can also ask your friends. Um, I'm assuming that at least one or two people in the room would already have the success, but otherwise you can, you're, please feel absolutely comfortable to call us. I'm, I'm happy to jump to your room and, uh, and help you out, okay? All right, so since we have, uh, we have the rooms ready, without further ado, you'll be able to see the timer in, your, uh, in the respective rooms. And I hope, I hope this will be a time well, uh, well spent. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're opening, we're opening the rooms. We're opening them uh, right now. that everybody has great before we uh before we continue let us just make sure that everybody's and that literally everybody's back and nobody's stuck in the room and that's what it appears yeah all right great 
Perfect. So thank you. And um, just a very quick, uh, quick question. If you, if you could use the chat to share with us um, how, uh, how was it like to work, uh, you know, to explore those, uh, those themes, those notions, those resources, historical resources, but also how was it like to reflect on them? Um, what was this experience? If you could share this in the chat, just use a couple words and, and let us know so that everybody has a chance to see. All right. So the group is so big, I think it's more efficient to do it through the chat. So if you're if you're willing to, if you're if you're willing to share, if you could tell us um, on the chat uh, if this was you know uh, an informative or maybe not so informative experience and 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 um, and why. Okay, just just a very quick first impression. Yeah, I can see that people are saying that it's useful to discuss in small groups. And it's interesting and engaging, very helpful to learn from others' reactions to the materials. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. It's Diane Leo. Uh, yeah, and uh, and Silver, thanks. Uh, okay, Barry, thanks for uh, for sharing your uh, yeah for your impressions. Um, testimonials were interesting. This Eva. Mm -hmm multiple perspectives, uh, all looking at the same event. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so Tina was also discussing with the group and a good conversation happened about memorials. Great, uh-huh. Um, so there's also Mar Marcy sharing and Karen. Okay, great, very eye-opening. Okay, and uh, yeah, and people are appreciating the, the testimonials. That's, um, that's great, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing and thanks for being so open. Yeah. Um, while while you're sharing, I will slowly I will slowly segue. Uh, I will slowly segue to uh, to one of uh, one of the palettes. Since we still have uh, some time, why don't we try to yeah to go over you know? And uh, for those of you who are willing to share, I think it will be be great to hear what you thought about um, each of um, each of those uh, of those mini sessions. They are arranged geographically. And somewhat also chronologically, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by uh, by sharing uh, Padlet number one. This is the this is the Jewish street. So historically, the heart of uh, Jewish Ashkenazim. This is where the Jewish life in that town started in 16th century. This is where the first synagogue stood. And what uh, what group number one was looking at was um, a, a mixture uh, of testimonies by Ben Sonnenschein and Alex Reifer about uh, the Jewish life in the town of Oshinti, which, as you know, is mostly associated with the, uh, with the Nazi concentration camp. So um, if, uh, if there was a person from group number one who could briefly tell us what your, what your impressions were on top of us be, having access to, to the palette and being able to read your, uh, your responses. Um, I think um, for what he wanted to say in his uh, um, uh, interview was you fight for what you believe in. I mean, he uh, he was uh, a child going to school with um, Christians and Jews, and they basically said that mm -hmm. you were the downfall for the killing of Jesus. So, like, I had wrote in, like mm -hmm. Holy War conflict, even like even back mm -hmm. then as a young child, you still fight for what you believe in, which I thought was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Darren. Yes, that's definitely an, an explicit, an explicit. Um reference to uh, to Christian anti-Semitism, right? And the experience that, uh, that Ben had. Uh, anything else that, that caught your attention in, uh, in either the testimony or maybe the photographs? One of the things that stood out to me too was how he was saying, well, we were talking about, yeah, how great it was that he was able to stand up for himself, but I was surprised too that he said at the end that they became friends with him after, mm -hmm. like, fighting and everything and I guess like they earn or he earned respect from them or something I just thought that was mm -hmm. interesting that at the end of it they did see him as a friend after all that mm -hmm. yeah, it's like mm -hmm. the enemy of my enemy right. is my friend yeah good point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you Nicole okay great uh-huh uh, all right. Anything, uh, anything else that you noticed either about the testimony or, or the other material so the images, were you able to look at the to look at those uh, the photographs, the historical photograph of the Jewish Street? Let me very quickly enlarge it for you. So this is the Jewish Street in 1939, right? It's a street right outside of the Market Square, and then we also have a contemporary photograph. I was just in that street this uh, this morning in the Shrine Team. Mm -hmm. 
right? Is there anything that you noticed? Any, if Look, you were to compare the two, the two photos? The question you yeah. ask about what kind of ethnic or national religious groups oh, okay. live in the town. Uh, I mean, I live um, very close to a, a large um, Jewish population um, bordering Lakewood. And um, when you ask those students, like, they always like want to know like what the difference two groups is. So like, I don't think they really know what, like between a, a acidic, Orthodox, like the two different um, mm -hmm. cells. So, like, I really like that question because being so close to like um, Lakewood, New Jersey, um, students just like have one general, um, I don't want to say stereotype, but one general, um, I guess, recognition of a group mm -hmm. over their town. So, I'm, I like that question. I was, I was mm -hmm. well said. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it's applicable to your context, Darren, right? Yep. Great, thanks. All right, perfect. Okay, any um, are there any other comments or questions that we should address? All right, I think it's um, sorry. I, just have, I have sorry. a quick question about the yeah, please, video. absolutely. Um, in what it looks like today, um, mm -hmm. is the the image on the right hand side like a memorial now? What is because it looks very obviously very different. The the one now looks like it's, I don't know, it, it doesn't look as functional, I guess is the word I want to use, as it right. did in the past. So what is building, mm -hmm. what is that structure now? Sure, absolutely. Right. So uh, thank you for thank you for pointing it out, Lisette. Um, let well, me uh, let me show you. So again, again, you know, here you can see that this street is not only full of people, right, but it's also full of buildings, right? It's a very lively street. So until 1939, uh, in the Jewish street, right, in the Shinchim, you had you had religious uh, Jewish and mostly Jewish religious institutions. So you, there was a there was a yeshiva, for example, that we're going to talk about, or so the high, the high school of you know for for the study of Talmud. Uh, there was, uh, you know, there was, there were actually quite, there was a number of synagogues and houses and houses of prayer. There was also a place for shechita, so ritual slaughter. There was a library, you know, there was a little hospital. Uh, there were also some charitable organizations. So it was a really full, um, it was full of energy, but also just full of Jewish life. It was a natural state of exchange before, before the war, before the war. Well, here you can see, uh, this just gives you a, like a vague impression, but it's really, it's, it's much more empty, right? And it's not only that there are no people, but it's also that most of the buildings are gone, especially those on the right-hand side, right? There's just a little bit of a structure to the right, right? That you probably ref you were referring to, Lisette, right? This is actually part of a hotel. And then further down, there's just nothing. It's all, it's all gone. And then there's a, there's a little, like an area with trees, which is a, uh, a site that we're going to discuss uh, in uh, in a moment, right? So I'll, I'll park this. I'll park this issue. But uh, but the, the state of the street, the fact that the buildings are so dilapidated, right? There, um, and most these are which are here are dilapidated, and most of them are gone. I think it's also a good metaphor of uh, of the fate of the local Jewish community because it was completely destroyed in the Holocaust, and a lot of these buildings were just taken down after the war. They were no longer in use. They were taken down, or they were just you know. They became dilapidated and they had to be taken down because they were at risk and then they were it was never it was never rebuilt so you know the physical structure actually also is a reflection of of the of the history of that of the community and the, the fact that the holocaust in Ashvinchim was very the project that that genocidal project was very effective so it it, it meant that not only people were, were killed had been killed uh, but also um you know the, their physical traces were uh were removed mm -hmm. Uh, so again, thank you for thank you for this question. And um, if you allow me to move on to to group number two, which brings us to somewhat similar context as far as um, as far as buildings and the physical structures, but the theme is uh, is different. It's about a bob of uh, a bob of yeshiva. If uh, there was a volunteer from group number two to share with us your impressions of uh, both the study and the discussion that you that you had. There's probably too many volunteers, so you must be arguing between you. Oh, this must be a very heated debate. Um, okay. Um, anybody willing to 
jump in and just very quickly tell us what you were what you were discussing in this in this group of what your impression of uh, of the testimony perhaps is. I think the testimony of the three different men allowed you to see the perspectives because they all have mm -hmm. different experiences. Like the first man that talked, I think his name was Ben. Um, it's a very relatable experience. Like he talks about his childhood, beginning school at age five, um, Polish school at age six, and then how he was, you know, pressured into skipping school. So I feel like that was a very relatable mm -hmm. experience that he had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there, do you think uh, it's Ashley, right? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. And is there, do you think there's, there's value in, uh, in this particular, you know, content and it being relatable? Yeah, I think so. I is think there, it, makes, it, it makes it accessible. Um, mm -hmm. like if you're to use it in your classroom. It's something that's attainable because your students can relate to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh huh. <laughs> Sure. Is there uh, is there anything else that that caught your attention, or maybe you know um, sparked any any questions, or maybe disagreement? You know, you're you're absolutely welcome to to share. And this is a question to Ashton, but also to everybody else and anyone else in the group. If there was if there were any comments, maybe also relating to uh, to the images. I have a question. So I don't know if it relates back to what you had previously said. So the building mm -hmm. survived the war. And then it was torn down and like, right. So I just why? <laughs> like was it because sure, sure. black again? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is quite a unique situation because we're dealing with a building which did survive the war and actually uh it has lived until 19. I'm sorry, until 2001. Let me let me double double click to uh to share this photo with you so that you can see it on well kind of full screen or half screen or, or a quarter of the screen, but still it's bigger. Uh, so yeah, this is a pretty sad situation. So, so since the, the building was around for quite a long time and it was it was a res it was a residential building after the war. So it was just used, you know, for for people um, uh, to live. And then sadly it was a, such a bad during the communist time, since Poland was a communist country from, from 1945 until 1989, a lot of the buildings like the communal housing was not taken care of, was not maintained properly. So by 2001, it was in a, such a bad condition that it needed to be taken down. I mean, I could imagine, you know, a, a, a proper effort, you know, on the part of the art conservator to, to fix this. But sadly in that, uh, in that context, this was not a, um, this was not a reality. The Auschwitz Jewish Center at that time was was around just for one year, so um, yes, it's um it's a, I would say it's a sad it's a very sad development that took place that that building was uh, was taken down along with others by the way uh, then the neighboring buildings were also taken down so what you can see now the empty there's a bit of an empty piece of land and a, and a chunk of a building this is a the recent a recent hotel a, a hotel Hilton Hotel actually which was built on the, uh, on that site recently. Mm -hmm. Is there more of an effort now to like preserve and save buildings as opposed to say like in 2001 when these buildings were torn down? Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. If you were to see, you know, photographs of the main market square, we'll get there in a moment, you'll see that they look much, much, much more different. So we're starting from the point of, you know, the Jewish street and and uh, the adjacent buildings, which really did not survive to this day, which is, which is really sad, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Ashley, for speaking on behalf of the group. Let's see what group number three was, was researching. We're actually getting closer and closer to the main market square. Now it's time for the great synagogue, which was partially discussed already, but um, I made a promise because there was a question part, so I made a promise to address it and I'll address it soon. But before that happens, I think we're all very curious to know what the discussion here was, uh, was about with what you found out both in, um, in the video with Ben, Alex, and Mark, and also, excuse me, and also, um, and also, uh, if you're able to to spot anything in those images, or any other remarks that you had studying this. Group number three. Um, I guess I'll start. So initially, in the uh, testimonial, the very first thing I thought of um, when allowing students to view this is how powerful it was that it was all men. Um, being able mm -hmm. to express um, emotions by things that they saw, 
Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember who it was, but one of the gentlemen spoke about seeing the synagogue burning and how he began yeah. to question God in viewing the mm -hmm. burning of the synagogue. And I thought that that was very, very powerful because, um, you know, for our young boys, sometimes being in touch with emotions can be a little difficult. So I think mm -hmm. just the imagery of seeing men talk about in their childhood, how they were experiencing all of these emotions um, was very powerful. Thanks we so much for, thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, go ahead, Tina. Sorry, we also spoke a good deal about memorials, the questions before the clip. Um, we discussed mm -hmm. the location of memorials, how soon after an event our memorials put up. Um, we shared our, mm -hmm. um, our experiences with everything from 9-11 memorials to um, the lynching uh, memorial down in Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the two pictures, the before and after, like what it looked like in the past, and then what it looks mm -hmm. like today, this is a great reflection of our conversation because we spoke a lot about memorials um, and that oftentimes they lack the, um, the element of each individual story, right? The, mm -hmm. the humanity, I guess, of a of a, um, an event that we would want to memorialize. So it's kind of interesting to look at the pictures after our conversation and look at how, how much life and um, possibility there is in the first one. And then in the second one, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just devoid of that. So, you mm -hmm. know, leveled. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really sure, I'm so curious about that memorial and what it says on those pieces and the accompanying um, you know, information, but we had really great <laughs> conversation about it. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tina. Let me very, very quickly just fill in. So you may remember from, from the first, uh, from the first, uh, one of the first images they're looking at, this was the Jewish street and there was a bit of an empty side, right? The right, hand, the right side of the image was, let me just go back very quickly instead of trying to retrieve this from memory, right? So this is the this is the image, right? This is the Jewish street and f further down the street on the right, you have like like a little forest, right? So this, uh, this is actually the forest. This is what it is. This is the site of the great synagogue. It stood there once it was it was destroyed by by Nazis by the Germans in the beginning of the war. And uh, recently in 2019, the Auschwitz Jewish Center has created a great synagogue memorial park on that side. This is and this is the, the photo of it. So you have the outline of the synagogue. Inside there is a there is a there is a micro park, so we call this a pocket park. So this is a this is a space. This is a green space. Uh, the photo was taken quite soon after the, the construction on, on the, in the spring, so it's not as green as it is right now. But uh, this is a space to commemorate the, the synagogue, which was um, well, it was um, it's a project of the Ashutosh Center of the city of Oshkenshim, all right, and also with contributions uh, of uh, save hours and their, and their descendants. It was, it was opened in a, in a ceremony in 2019 on the 80th anniversary of the destruction of the great, of the great synagogue. And since then there's this, uh, this space to commemorate the fact that there once stood uh, the great synagogue, which actually also, the site also marks the first synagogue ever in the from 1588. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Really, really, yeah, really please. I want to add one thing. Yeah. Um, in the testimonials, I thought what was really important was the way um, the speakers were conveying just what might seem like pedestrian in someone's life, like what they ate, how they celebrated holiday, you know, what mm -hmm. every Friday and Sunday night was like, you know, what were some of the rituals, what did they eat, what went into the food preparation. So I think that that made it even like more the human condition more relatable because we don't like sometimes mm -hmm. these ordinary moments but then in an instant how something so ordinary can become so pronounced in the mm -hmm. aftermath you know in the aftermath of mm -hmm. that so i just thought it made it so much more relatable i guess i don't mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. more relatable, but i just like you could see yourself like being in a situation whereby you're just going through your daily routine and then something changes that irreversibly changes that forever and mm -hmm. how more pronounced those moments are. So I thought that was important mm -hmm. for the testimony. Thank you so much, Gina. So the issue of related, re relatability, right? If I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we'll share, we shall uh, proceed further down to the main market square. So the heart of the town, every medieval town in Europe needs to have a market square and the Shenzhen was no different and is no different at all. It, the town itself was established in the 13th century and there is a, I'm going to very briefly show you the, this is a today, the contemporary, the contemporary, um, well, contemporary market square, the contemporary look on, or view of the market square in, in Shenzhen. This is what it looks like today. Right, and then you'll see before I, uh, I hand over to uh, to a speaker on behalf of the group. Uh, as you can see, this is the historical photograph that we used and then Yael and I used for the for the opening of the session. It's not much different, right? As far as the buildings, uh, actually, almost all of the buildings in the main market square of Shenzhen today are exactly the same ones. They have survived. Shenzhen had never experienced any bombings, any major bombings during World War II. So the buildings are are still there. Uh, yeah, is there anything that caught your attention? Group number four about the main market square, also the video with Edward, Edward Spett, who talks about his pre-war pre -war life and growing up in the Shvinchin. Anything, or maybe the discussion, anything worth, uh, worth uh, mentioning, either just from a discussion, but also in the educational, in the educational uh, context. Well, we noticed um, what you pointed out already that there was, there really is no change. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, now again, that I'm looking at the two images again, I'm wondering why was that? Was it, you know, was there a reason, you know, why it was kept, you know, they, they were, were they randomly targeting other areas and just left that because it was useful to, for, um, to the Nazis for a reason? Mm -hmm. Because again, after so much destruction, why is it that this main area is kept pretty much the same? Um, and I think that the um, one of the questions we had a couple, but one of the the questions that I think resonated with a lot of us, um, you know, most of us are educators, and um, we are learning how to um, bring this into our classrooms in, in a way that you know um, it's effective. Um, but one of the people in our group, Barry, asked, you know, how can we bring this history out to the general public? Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, that question, you know, resonated with most of us because there are still people out there that don't know the history. I mean, personally, I was in college when I learned about the Holocaust for the first time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we get, and there will be people who, you know, I was lucky, I went to college and I took, you know, a course that led me into, you know, further studying the Holocaust. There are people who don't have the same experience. So how do we get that out there to those who mm -hmm. won't have my, you know, our experiences? Thank you so much, Lisette. Um, on your, on the second question, let me just respond. It seems like quite a huge challenge. And this is the, this is the boat that we're all in right now. Um, but just to go back very quickly to the to the first question that you asked about the reasons why Shenzhen was never bombed during the war. So here the situation was that uh, when when the war started, after two months, Shenzhen was incorporated directly into the Third Reich. So as opposed to the part of uh, of pre-war Poland, which was made which were made into a buffer state called Generalgouvernement, and they were there were this was a separate separate entity which did suffer a lot of a lot of bombings and terror. So Shenzhen, which is in which was located in Western Poland, very close to the German border, along with other strips of, of Western Poland, they were just incorporated into Germany and they were, they were legally, they were, this was legally the Third Reich. So the, the idea was not to bomb your own state basically, right? It was obviously that was an, an incredible amount of terror, you know, and, and ethnic cleansing and, and, and the Holocaust, right? So crimes perpetrated on the local populations and also forced, forced removal and also forced settlements, right? Oshinchen was also planned to be a one of the model German settlements in the East. So in the, in the context of the idea of the Lebensraum, the living space, right? Yeah, the idea was to, that was like colonizing plan and that there were actually, there were actually you know, people brought in from Germany, German settlers, oftentimes um, highly skilled specialists who are also then also employed by the Auschwitz, by the Auschwitz, uh, by the Auschwitz camp to run different kinds of operations. Uh, but then, so that's why also they were not bombing. They're actually remodeling the town. There was a huge, there was a huge project of also architectural interventions and remodeling the town to make it look more German, right? So as opposed to be bombing and destroying it, what they were doing, they were obviously destroying the local population, primarily the, the Jewish population, but also non-Jewish Poles were, were affected. 
but they did not destroy the infrastructure. It's on the opposite. They wanted to, to use it to their benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a follow-up to that though, because um, at the end of the war, they were trying to get rid of evidence and they were bombing pretty much indiscriminately. So why not take that opportunity to, again, destroy these, these you know, locations where, again, there's so much Jewish history alive? Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, what they're doing indeed is they're blowing up, you know, the crematorium gas chambers at, at Auschwitz, right, at the camps in order to, uh, you know, to, well, remove the traces of the genocide that they perpetrated, but they did not blow up the town itself, right? They they left it, I mean, I'm not sure with whether they would do it anyway, but there was just not enough time, the, you know, the, the retreat of the German army in face of the, in the, of, the, in, of the incoming Soviets was done, was done very hastily. I mean, they were, they were not even able to, to destroy the all of the camp infrastructure, not mentioning other other places which had less priority as far as you know, um, removing the um, the proof of uh, of the crime. I have, so I have that a question, definitely, yeah, uh, and this may yeah. be later time in a later uh, seminar. But I'm looking under Edward Spett's uh, testimony, and of course there are mm -hmm. names of camps that are very unfamiliar to me. Uh, of course, there are the ones that everyone knows about uh, and have uh, uh, read about. How many camps were there, concentration camps, were there set up in the um, areas that the Nazis uh, were in charge of? Right. So uh, as far as, right, you're, you're right. There are names which some of them are really like prominent that uh, people would know, like Buchenwald, for example, right? But then you have places like Blechhammer, for example, which is a sub camp of Auschwitz. The, the Auschwitz complex had had a network of 40 different sub camps. Those were uh, Auschwitz itself, right? This was uh, those sub camps were located in the vicinity, more or less, more, the majority of them were located in the vicinity. And those were usually, they were attached to different uh, plants, like, for example, like steelworks or coal mines, right? In the region, this is a coal mining region. So there were around 40. Now, as far as the total number of different concentration and forced labor camps, it really varies. I mean, there it's difficult to give the exact, the, uh, like a single number because it really depends on the methodology that you, that you use. And I've seen estimates ranging from 400 to 1500, right? It depends on whether you, you count, for example, uh, a camp as a single entity or you count, you count it with its, with its satellite camps and so on and so forth. But this is, this is a really a large number, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry, for that question. We'll, uh, we'll segue, uh, we'll speed up a little bit and we'll segue to the main market square to um, the, second, uh, the second set, which is devoted to the main market square. And this talks ex uh, like exclusively about World War II and, and the, how the situation changed for the, for the, for the Jews uh, of Oshvin team. And there's also photographs. Let me show you this very quickly and large for everyone to be able to see. This is the same market square. But this is early. This is early in the war, and you can see there's a there's a gentleman wearing a, uh, a star, uh, an armband with a star of David. So some of these people in the photograph are definitely the Jewish residents of the town of Auschwitz, as it was called at the, at the time. And in the second photograph, you can also see uh, there are two civilians of unknown identity. And they could be German settlers, and they're speaking to a German policeman. And above, there's a sign in, in German which says, Für Juden verboten, so forbidden to the Jews. Uh, where Are there any comments about this one? Or questions on top of the discussion that you've already had? And I know I can, I can see that you have listed different kinds of discriminatory measures which were introduced by the German administration of Auschwitz at the time of the, of the town of Auschwitz. But is there anything that caught your attention that you found meaningful? Okay, no sound on my end. Uh, Okay, I'm assuming that the subject has been exhausted to the extent that it does not ask for further discussion. That's okay. That's okay. We, you were, we spoke uh, uh, we spoke with Sarah about sharing the links with you afterwards, so you'll be, you're welcome to return to this uh, later. And then in that case, we'll uh, we'll move on to uh, to the six 
point number six on our map, on the map of Shinchim, the Jan, Father Jan's Karbik Square. Uh, this is the modern day photograph of that location. You can see the Auschwitz Jewish Center in the background, but we're talking about the square itself, right? And then also the historical, uh, the historical image, which shows you the synagogue, which is right now part of the Auschwitz Jewish Center and people gathering in front. This photograph was taken uh, in early 1941, in March or April 1941, during the deportation. This is a time when uh, on the German order, Jews of the town of Auschwitz were forced to leave and they were resettled, forcefully resettled to three neighboring locations, major, city, major cities of Sosnowiec, Benjin and Shanov. And from those cities later, they were sent to, uh, to Auschwitz, to the concentration camp, concentration death camp, and most of them were, were murdered. And there's a testimony here as well, um, with three people describing uh, describing the deportations. Are there any points that that caught your attention uh, here? Group number six. Could you please make the what it looks like today photo larger for us? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So what about this square? Anything catching your, your attention? Um, any questions, any comments? Group number six. I know there were a lot of comments were written here, so I'm sure you have things to share. I have a question. What is that brown yes. box looking thing? Right, the, so the thing on the in the right section of the photograph, right? Yes. The thing to the right, yeah. So this, um, we do not have an official an official name for this. Um, uh, we call this an exhibition element. This is part of the core exhibition of our museum. Uh, it, and it's, you cannot see this uh, too well in this photograph, but it's more shaped like a cheese wedge, a big cheese wedge, nothing to do with cheese though. This is an, a, a part of the, of the uh, of our exhibition. And it has the holes on the side. Like, like you, when, you, when you peek inside, you'll see there are um, images from the graphic novels. There are seven different graphic novels about the pre-war history of Oshintim and its Jewish residents. They, each of those novels is connected with a different, um, with a different uh, object from our, from our exhibition. And actually, I think we'll be, we'll be more than happy to send you a sample, to email a sample to share with everyone. If you wanted to to follow this, these are personal stories. So visitors to the square, right, can um, can use this opportunity. And before ever entering the museum, to which the, the element is pointing, you can you can engage with those with those stories uh, about the square itself. Since um, at the moment nobody's yet ready to to share, so let me just very quickly fill everybody in. So the the, the, the significance of this location is that this this is one of the two squares. From where people were taken on those uh, on those deportations, and I, and I mentioned before, so this is literally a site of the Holocaust. It's not only a site of Jewish life, since this was part of, of Jewish the Jewish town of Oshinchi before the war, but it's also it's also uh, a site of uh, of the Holocaust. And currently, this is also the site at which the the Auschwitz Jewish Center is uh, uh, is located. So both the, the synagogue and the museum behind. Mm -hmm. And in the videos, which you're also later welcome to revisit, you had three survivors who were talking about the process of being deported. Uh, they, were, they were sharing their experiences, including also an experience of being taken. The, uh, um, the woman, you can see there's a, just a little, I'm sorry, this will not start. Yeah, her. So Manya Kay, who's a, who's a Holocaust survivor, also from Australia, in, in, in um, Australia after the war, she was taken in to that deportation in the spring of 941, totally by, by accident, as she was delivering food to those people who had been already imprisoned in the square. So she went, the, she talks about, in the video, she talks about, she talks about this experience of, of being, um, of being dragged into the crowd and then being sent, uh, sent away. Uh, okay, so we'll now, uh, we'll now, we have two more, uh, two more, um, board to uh to discuss and two more two more aspects yeah please Earl, were you trying to share something uh no i i was about to go ahead i'll come back all right 
Thanks. Um, the Kluger house and the Kluger family, the, uh, the last Jewish resident of Oshvinchim, Shimon Kluger, uh, whom you can see in the photograph uh, on, the, on the left column. This is the gentleman on the right. And then also in the very center of the black and white photograph, this is the boy uh, wearing, a, wearing a hat. Shimon Kluger turned out to be the last Jewish resident of Oshvinchim. The Klugers were a regular family regular Jewish family from, from the town, a family of 11, there were nine kids. They lived in this house, the white, the white house, right? And uh, Shimon turned out to be the last Jewish resident of Oshinchi with his passing uh, on May 26, 2000. As far as we know, the Jewish history of the town, uh, of the town ended. And what we're discussing in this, uh, in this part is, um, the failed attempt to recreate the Jewish community in Oshvinchim after the war. But there were around, of the 8,000 original Jewish residents, there were around 200 who, who came back to Oshvinchim or 200 Jewish Jews who came, who found themselves in Oshvinchim because we're not even sure if all of them were originally from there. It's a very, very small number. And we have testimonies of, uh, of Morris, uh, Ben and Lola who talk about, who talk about the return to Oshvinchim and finding, finding no one and also Making taking the decision uh, taking the decision to um, to leave uh, to leave Oshvinchim and leave, leave Poland. Is there anything that Group Number Seven wanted to raise in this context? Um, so we spoke a lot about heritage, and that was kind of the starting question for us. And we spent a good amount of time on it, um, mm -hmm. and not realizing the connection that was going to be made behind it. That many of us, whether it was visiting. Um, a place where our family was just within the United States or some area that was familiar to families or even going overseas to where they were originally from, mm -hmm. we were able to kind of bring up happy memories and like saying, yes, if given the opportunity, we would absolutely go to these other places. Then we watched the video and it's um, three people being interviewed that all basically say, either they didn't go back at all, or uh, they were fearful of going back and walking across mm -hmm. the threshold into their house, if it was even still standing. Um, and having, again, the one, three of the brothers survived to immediately go to the United States. One um, ends up going, I think it was, so, it wasn't the actual village at first, he moves back to it later, I believe. Um, so I, one of the things that lingering questions that I had was, did the brothers ever come back, especially it doesn't say, um, which of the three passes away first. So I was curious, did they end up going back to the village? Obviously not staying or settling, but did anybody, uh, the other two survivors come back? That was something that kind of crossed our minds. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, also for, for making the contemporary connection. Yes, as far as we know, they, ne they never never came back, actually. Yeah. And just like as a mm. side note, too, um, you know, with students using this, right, they would make the connection between their heritage and if they visited places, and that might kind of draw in like a personal connection when looking at this as well. So I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, all right. So uh, thanks again for for sharing uh, uh, about this particular aspect of, of the history, the the returns, right, the difficult returns of the handful of survivors, and and the fact that uh, Shimon Kluger was the was the last uh, was the last Jewish resident of uh, of the town. And then since we're doing we're, we've been we've been doing this chronologically, we come to the point where. Uh, where we we want to invite a discussion about modern about modern Oshvinch, right? So it's kind of like making we've just taken a made made a circle and returning to those original photographs from the beginning of our meeting, but also there's um, there's two different modern day resources. Well, one of them is not super modern because it's from the year 2000. It's a letter written by by a young uh, by a young uh, female resident of Oshvinch, a 16 year old girl, wrote a letter to the Polish president. And then there also, there's also a super recent video of, our, uh, of, uh, of a resident of Oshinchim who recently joined our, our staff, Camille. So I'd be curious to know if you have uh, any thoughts about, about this one, about what it, feel, what it may feel like to live in Oshinchim, what, kind of, what kind of challenges do the modern day residents face if, uh, if they're impacted 
in any way by by the wartime history. What were your feelings about about this one? We talked a lot about how um, the the people living in the town. Um, it feels like they're the modern town's existence is eclipsed by its historical significance, and that it's hard for us as outsiders to see it as a town in and of itself. Um, and personally, we ran out of time here, but the thing that I was wondering at the end of our conversation was, um, what are some of the stories now? What does it mean to people who live there? Um, and, you know, we study a lot about what it means to those of us who, who don't live there. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know something about that. Um, but I have no idea what it feels like to live with that history, to live in the shadow of that history, mm -hmm. um, especially given the fact that there are no Jewish survivors remaining in the village. What is that? What does that feel like? And the more we talked about mm -hmm. it, the more curious um, mm -hmm. I became. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. from some of the other mm -hmm. people too. We had a lot to say in our group. Thank you so much, Karen. Is there was anybody else who wanted to chime in from uh, from the group? Yeah, um, to make a, a contemporary um, reference, and it, it was a TV episode of The Twilight Zone about Dachau called uh, Death's Head Revisited. And at the end, the character, and it's modern day, well, in the 60s, and says, you know, Dachau, why does it still stand? And what I'm curious is people from these towns, what the feelings are today saying, <clears throat> you know, we must remember, we must take blame, we must be culpable. And then how many other people say, this was 80 years ago, why do we keep these memorials standing? And those obviously mm -hmm. are not people who were you know, affected or the families were affected by the Holocaust, other than perhaps being residents of the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic. That's a big question and um, and a very very I would say spot spot on. I mean, both of you, Karen and Barry, thanks for that. Uh, it's indeed uh, quite a complex situation, right? Since the residents of Shinchimchen, it's uh, to add to the complexity of just living in a town which bears so much stigma, right? The most notorious symbol of the of the Holocaust and, and the Nazi genocide, and one of the key symbols of World War II. On top of that, there, there's uh, when you factor in um, the fact that the, the local non-Jewish population had also been been affected, right? The fact that Auschwitz the camps. Uh, to Auschwitz, there were 150,000 Polish non-Jews deported and half of them lost their lives, right? And the fact that also a lot of residents of the nearby villages were, were deported to Auschwitz for, for nothing, just for, for being, you know, neighbors to that location. Uh, so it means that there's also an impact of the camp of, on the non-Jewish population. And on top of that, when you factor in also the, the population exchange and the fact that around 50 or 60% of today's residents are not originally from there, so they, they have no personal connection to this. It really creates, and uh, on top of the other complexities and you know and the religious symbols and the lack of the lack the lack of them, different kinds of conflicts of memory over over the years and uh, the silence over the history of Auschwitz and silence over the especially silence over the Jewish victims in Poland during the communist period when nothing was taught about the Holocaust at all. And it was all treated like wholesale as victims of fascism. It's really a very complex situation. Um, sadly, we will not have enough time to unpack all those uh, all those complexities in this particular session. And I'm I'm hoping that will be that will also be an opportunity to follow up on this. But I'm so my, I see my task here is more making it even more complex than it is <laughs> than it is uh, already. But in fact, there's definitely a um, uh, a very uh, a very vivid stigma until until today and it's it's changing a lot but still the stigma uh, the stigma is definitely is definitely there mm -hmm. uh, we're probably uh, already running 
out of time, I'm assuming, right? I have not been controlling so, so well, but uh, if we could just steal maybe a couple more minutes from your time, just to make sure that we address, I'm just checking with, uh, I'm just checking with, uh, with Sarah uh, and the team, what, what the time situation is. So uh, Sarah had to go. Um, she's teaching her oh, class sorry. tonight. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Um, and <laughs> you have you have plenty of time because this is scheduled during regular class time between four thirty and seven fifteen. Um, so you're good to leave uh, time for question and answers and things like that. If you have more, oh. I actually had I had a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah. Please go ahead. And and thank, you, thank, you just... for, thank you for thank you for for yeah. Thanks. That's, that sounds lovely. That we have time. That's great. Of, that's the best luxury you can have. Oh yeah, you definitely you definitely have time. Um, um, so just coming off of the last thing you were talking about, the people who were deported strictly because they lived around the the sub camps, I mm -hmm. am disappointed in myself to say that I don't have a lot of knowledge about that. Could you just mm -hmm. could you tell me the littlest bit more? <laughs> Sure, sure, absolutely, and thank you, thank you for asking. Right, so you know, this is also, uh, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite indicative of the of the complexities, right? I mean, depending on depending on where you come from, you know, we we see Auschwitz in very different uh, in very different ways, and I, I think it's I think it's perfectly I think it's perfectly natural. We have you know different policy, so to speak. Um, when you look at the when you look at development of Auschwitz, the fact that you know the the, the plans were made in in late 1939. And then the, the establishment of the camp, uh, the official opening for of it took place in on the first transfer of, of, uh, of prisoners arrived in on June 14, 1940. And this was at the time when Auschwitz was when the camp was not yet a site of the Holocaust per se, but it was it originally was planned as a regular concentration camp modeled after Dachau, for example, or or Buchenwald. So they're like the classical, so to speak. German Nazi concentration camps with the uh, with the mission of terrorizing local populations, right, and crushing any political uh, like resistance to the Nazi regime. But over time, Auschwitz and other sites developed as uh, as sites of mass murder of the Jews, right, as uh, sites of the Holocaust. Uh, Auschwitz being the, the sadly the most prominent example. Uh, so, in the process of creating the camps, in the process of um, converting, in case of Auschwitz, the military, the, mil the former. Polish army infrastructure, former Polish military barracks into the camps, right? They employed the local population. So they were they were literally sending people from neighboring villages to do the construction work, right? And then uh, also a lot of these people were simply sent to the camps just for, you know, being witnesses to this or just, you know, or just being part of the, just being part of the system. And, and also as they were expanding the camps, because they were in the, this was a project which was constantly expanded geographically, Taking, there were, it meant taking down buildings, right, of, of private people, and obviously there was no way for you to, you know, to go to a court or whatever, because you were, you were, a, you know, a, a citizen of the, a, not even a citizen, you were a, uh, a resident of the Third Reich, but without the rights of citizenship, you, um, the house would be taken down, and this is the case of, uh, of around 3,000 residents of, of Oshinching, whose houses were taken down, and uh, they were sent, some of them were sent to Auschwitz, Others were scattered all around, right? They were sent to so Nazi occupied Poland, for example, at random by uh, by trains. So on top of the entire Jewish population of the town murdered in the Holocaust, you had around around half of the non-Jewish population deported, uh, removed, and either deported to the camps or just sent at random to different to different uh, to different locations. Wow, thank you. I guess I just never really put those pieces together. You know, like we we focus on sometimes mm -hmm. I I don't know if it's just like that we just focus on some of the same things over and over again. So when you realize, you know, after a while of teaching something that there's something that you could add in, but you didn't know how to put the pieces together. That's I think that's really, really important to make mention of. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for asking again. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks. Um, okay, so with the luxury that we have, I'm going to of time. Uh, I'm going to very quickly, but again, also not risking, not risking uh, anger from you <laughs> for extending that session too much. I'm going to return to the presentation again since we were recording your questions, and we have two. Okay, so we have we have two questions. One of them is what approximate percentage of the buildings that were used by the Jewish community no longer exist. There is such a stark loss in all these comparison photos. 
Yeah, there definitely uh, definitely is that that loss. Um, you can really see this, right? And this is also, I mean, the the, the example that I use for so the Jury Street, I think, is the most the most glaring one. But it also applies to other places in Poland, and it also applies especially to 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 sites of prayer, to synagogues where most of them were were destroyed, either during the war, but also sometimes right uh, right after. Um, we do not know the exact percentage. I can what I can tell you is that in Shenzhen before the war there were twenty different Jewish sites of prayer. Several of them were individual buildings, like the synagogue that is right now the part of the Auschwitz Jewish Center, or the Great Synagogue, which was destroyed by by Nazis. And right now the, there's a memorial park on the site. And of those twenty of those twenty synagogues, there's only one which still exists and continues to function, and that will be the the synagogue which is part of the of the Auschwitz Jewish Center. Uh, all the other synagogues were either taken down or they were converted to different purposes and they never regained uh, their original uh, their original function right um, uh, and then there's also a question about uh, uh, about Hasidism whether uh, whether re whether people of uh, of this town so people of change were primarily Hasidic and that's yes I, I can I can confirm that again we do not know the exact uh, percentage right so there were no Registers kept, as far at least to the best of my knowledge, uh, with um, with that sort of data. But most of the synagogues, um, most of the houses of prayer sites of Jewish prayer in Ashvinchim were Hasidic Stiblach, right? And they were mostly followers of the Bobover, of the Bobover and Shanover Hasidism. So those two branches. How many visitors to direct to Auschwitz and Ashvinchim annually? Are those numbers changing, or are they fairly constant? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Until I mean, so COVID and pre-COVID are. Uh, thank you for this for this contemporary question. COVID and pre-COVID are, are are obviously two completely different realities. Um, so until until 2000 uh, until March 2020, the um, the museum Auschwitz Museum, so the site of the site of the former camps, which is right now maintained as a museum by the Polish state with the help of of the endowment. Primarily sponsored by by the German state, but also with with contributions from other countries all around. So that site, the main site, would have two million visitors annually. And the town of Oshinchim, in the town of Oshinchim, our museum would be the most visited place, and we would have around thirty thousand people annually. So slightly more, like one point half percent of people who go who go to see Auschwitz would also come to see the town of Oshinchim. And, uh, and, our, and our museum. So this is just a small fraction. And there is a number of reasons why. Uh, I would say that primarily it would be the pure logistics. The fact that uh, Shinchim is a very small town and most of the visitors to the former camps, they come from the major city with an airport nearby. The city is called Krakow. This is actually where I'm broadcasting from myself. This is where I live. But you don't really need to go through the town to see the camps. This is the this is the reality, uh, and it's also that uh, you know the site of Auschwitz is, um, I would say, impactful enough for it to be the sole destination of, of visitors for that day. That uh, obviously creates um, a particular dynamic in the town itself because a lot of a lot of residents feel like you know they're out of the picture and they're not important at all, which kind of is true, right? Um, uh, so it's a bit of a challenge for the town to maintain uh, its identity, not in opposition to Auschwitz, the camp, but also to try to, you know, include this, but at the same time continue as a town, which again goes back to one of the questions that were asked. Um, okay, there's another question. I did a lesson on the tree that survived 9-11. Just curious about the agriculture. Is there anything that survived being that it was not bombed? I'm not a big expert to be to be frank about the uh, agricultural infrastructure, so I can't really tell you whether there were like trees that survived and so on. Um, and, uh, sadly, I do not have an answer to this uh, question. I apologize. Okay, and I'm checking. Oh, there more, there's more questions. Sorry, uh, is the AJC visited often by foreigners? Uh, right, uh, and you're, you're, you said that I'm very disappointed that I visited the area and I was unaware of the center. Yeah, so this actually goes back to um, to what, what I kind of touched upon a moment ago, uh, the fact that most visitors ex ex indeed do not come to our to our center, partly also due to the fact that 
um, that when you go to to see that when you go to visit Auschwitz, you you rarely look for something else. Even though we do have signs, they're actually quite big signs advertising our museum in the vicinity of Auschwitz. But obviously, you know, you don't want to be too intensively advertising any other side in the area, but it's uh, it's also that uh, there's, there's there, it, it could be that there's also, there could be more information posted anyway. But there are visit yes. The, so as far as foreigners, as far as our museum, uh, the main group of visitors are Polish students, right? So Polish school kids. The second largest group of visitors in that 30,000 pre-pandemic number would be, um, would be German students and, and German visitors. And then uh, the, the third group would be uh, Americans. The fourth Israel, the fourth would be the British, and then the fifth Israelis, and so on. And then smaller, and, and then smaller, and then smaller numbers are from different countries. Does anyone argue on behalf of the Wait, Magic, preservation before, of detail? Before you go yeah, on, please. can I add something? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the challenges that the Auschwitz Jewish Center has and other um, institutions that are especially in small towns and villages um, is that at least from an American perspective. Um, I always viewed Poland, a trip to Poland as a place to visit Holocaust sites only. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is shift it to not only visit Holocaust sites, but um, visit Poland and understand Poles today and understand the impact of Holocaust memory and living by sites of atrocity. Um, and so I think this is something that that we at the AJC are continuing to work towards, um, but trying to change the, the narrative of a visit to Poland. So it's not just Holocaust, um, but it's also heritage. And it's also how are Poles dealing with this, this history and this heritage. Um, as opposed to just coming, visiting a site, and leaving. Great, thank you, Al. Thank you for uh, for adding this. Yes, very important part of our of our mission, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, two more questions, and uh, I hope we'll have a minute or two to address them. So I'll do it very quickly. Uh, does anyone argue on behalf of the historic preservation of the town? The modern buildings seem to divert from the history. Oh yeah, that's a complex one. That's a it's a question of you know on one hand the philosophy of art conservation or historic preservation. And it's also the you know it's the law and its implementation. So it gets different. It it really depends on the local art conservator, and the politics. Uh, I would agree that some of the modern buildings, yeah, they do seem to divert from uh, from the history. I would just say that you know. Uh, compared to other parts of Poland, it's it's not so bad. I mean, Oświęcim is still lucky to have a lot of original original buildings from before the war, and these are actually preserved quite uh, quite well, I would say, at least for for the local for the local condition. But I, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I would agree. And then there's a question about compensation: Are uh, the families that live now she's compensated when driven from from their homes? Whoa, that's uh, that's indeed a, a complex one. And also a very contemporary, a very contemporary question. So uh, most of the families, I would say that a most of the families who that were that were uh, that were driven out who were Jewish obviously lost their lives, right? So they had never been uh, they had never been compensated unless there were any heirs, and then there were intergovernmental in, there were intergovernmental mm, agreements between the United States, between Israel, and the Communist Poland. So there was some degree of, I'm not a big expert in compensation, so uh, I'm just giving you a quite a, a, quite a vague response to this. Um, but there were, there were indeed um, some attempts to compensate wholesale, right, between the countries and then each of the country, each of the country which received compensation would be then responsible for distribution. But there were still a lot of people who were left out uh, from those, uh, from those, uh, from those agreements. As far as non-Jewish Poles who were also driven out, as I, as I mentioned, in connection with creation and expansion of the Auschwitz, of Auschwitz camps, a lot of them had never received uh, compensation either. After the war, some of the survivors, some of the non-Jewish survivors, some of the Polish non-Jewish survivors of World War II would be returning to Oświęcim to see, for example, that their house was, uh, was gone and that actually the camp of Auschwitz or the camp, you know, Auschwitz to Birkenau was built on that site, right? So, 
that's because that's exactly what happened in 1942 when when Auschwitz to Birkenau was built they they raised to the ground entire village um and they built the camps on its site so a lot of a lot of uh, also a lot of non-jewish uh non-jewish uh residents of Shinshu lost their property and they never got it back and and sometimes they they not they did not get a compensation um ever right or they got something very uh very symbolic from the from the new communist state so this is again quite a complex issue and to this day there's um there's trials in front of courts for, of, of people trying to get compensation it's not very it's not very efficient i would say so the, the impact of Auschwitz is uh, the legacy of Auschwitz is, uh, is really like I would say looming over us and 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 it's uh, and its residents until today definitely that's um, that's part of the story. Mm -hmm. ah, all right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I apologize for extending the session, but but uh, it was a luxury of having the extra time and your and your attention. I think we're we're able to address some of the some of the questions we will be more than happy to share the materials with you right and also and also uh recommend both apps so the iwalk the original the source of, of our workshop today and but also Auschwitz in the app that under the Auschwitz Jewish Center developed I also want to use this opportunity to, to thank my great thank my great colleague Yael for for helping me put prepare this workshop and, and run it for you and thank you everyone again for uh, for being so attentive and for sharing your your uh, perspectives, uh, yeah, thank you so much. And obviously, thank you for to the entire to the Holocaust uh, Research Center and um, and King University for for making this session possible. I'll stop sharing for now. I just want to echo Machek and thank you all for your participation. Um, if there are any materials or or if we can support you using any of these materials in your classrooms, please let us know. We would be happy to. Um, and thank you very much to the Holocaust Resource Center for um, inviting us to do this. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much for being here. I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I, I projected myself to my classroom, so I didn't know if it was working. <laughs> um, um, thank you both. Adara, yes, is here. Yes. So just uh, I yes. want to say thank you, you for being here, for your kind introductions, and for sharing this history with us. So um, I am teaching a class, so I will see you all later, but thank you so much. <laughs> <Another class. clears throat> and I'm moving from my house in a day. So I'm at home, but thank you so much for making this tonight's program happen. And what I would love to do is remind everybody that this Friday, there is a program happening. Who can tell me what it is? Unmute yourself and yell out. My friends, don't make me do it. Let's not make our instructors do this. It is the first General Assembly meeting of the year for the Diversity Council. And it is a virtual program and it features Clyde Ford, whose father was the first black computer engineer who worked with IBM um, during the war years. And he will be leading the program. It begins at 3 p.m. And it will be over by 5. Again, it's virtual. We encourage everyone to come out. Um, Mr. Ford is an exceptional speaker, award-winning author. And he has lesson plans that accompany the program. So we would really like to see all of you there. Do the best that you can. We know life is really busy. Uh, but if I can make it, closing on two houses that day, we can all make it. Um, and one thing to remind everybody, um, just so everybody here, you know, remembers, we present all of our programs free of charge, um, you know, for educators and the community. And my commitment is to continue doing that. But just to remind people, because I did have a few emails earlier, um, we always welcome donations so that we, we can continue to bring in, you know, excellent um, state-of-the-art programs with our speakers from around the world. And the only way that we can do that and be sure that we can pay people to come and speak to us, um, because the same way that we want all of you to be recognized for your contributions, um, we want our guest speakers um, 